we're into our first uh, lot of parallel sessions uh, in the afternoon. And this presentation is Gollum and the Librarians, What is Really Precious? And the presenter is Elaine Harrington. And Elaine is Special Collections Assistant Librarian in UCC Library. And she's previously worked in UCC Library's Customer Services, Interlibrary Loan and the Health Sciences Branch. And Elaine is an active member of the LAI Rare Books and Special Collections Group and Connell's Collections, Preservation and Conservation Subcommittee. That was hard to say. And uh, Elaine's talk is going to be about 20 minutes, um, so there will be time for questions afterwards if anybody's any questions. So I'll hand you over to Elaine and give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Um, okay, this talk presentation is going to be rather free-flowing. Um, I'm going to try and do it without notes. I do have a few backup index cards just in case things get a little hairy. Um, I'm going to talk first about how I came to this topic. Um, and as much it would seem from this morning, everything begins with Jane Burns. Um, I had a conversation with her, I'd seen the call for papers and I thought, oh, I'm not smashing any stereotypes, I'm not being anywhere loud enough. And she said, no you are, you're doing stuff Elaine, you're contributing. And I had done a blog post with Maura Flynn, which I'll talk about more in a minute. And she said, use that as a basis and go on from there and you'll get something. Um, so taking Jane's advice from this morning, it's not Shakespeare, but hopefully it'll be interesting. What is it really about? It's about how we learn skills, um, what's important to me, and knowing that you're going to be learning skills for the rest of your life, be it in a personal or in a professional capacity. So. The post that Maura and I um, did last June for Lib Focus, it started, Maura had been attending the Health Sciences Library Group Conference in May. And while I said, yes, in my bio, that I worked for six months in Health Sciences, it was a very brief six months as a library assistant, and I did not understand any of this mathematical style notation when I saw Maura tweet about it. The great thing about librarians is, if you ask, you're going to get answers. And I had about four or five people replying to me straight away saying it's this, it does that, it does the other. And you can wonder, why did I attend virtually a conference on Twitter, especially in one that I had no interest in? I mean, they were not talking about special collections, I'll tell you. It's because it's all the other things that you learn, the random incidental details. So you can look at the post to see what Maura said about how it went and what they spoke about from a health sciences point of view. But I was looking at it for stuff like what Lorna Rooney Ferris said, time for CPD is limited, do what you're interested in. Jane Burns, again, um, I swear she isn't paying me for every shout out. If you learn it, you can transfer it. And there will be others that I'll refer to as I go on. So why did I use Gollum? I should say first, if you're looking for the Hungarian guy made out of clay, the G-O-L-E-M, you are also in the wrong room. This is Gollum as in The Hobbit and Lords of the Rings. Gollum is singular minded. He is really driven. He is in search of one thing. He knows exactly what he wants and nothing is going to stand in his way, even at the risk of his own life in the end. He wants a ring, the one ring. When I looked and analyzed all of the various words, now, okay, I chucked out a lot to get what I wanted. Um, precious is one that comes up the most. Want and <laughs> Is this my Martin O'Connor fire alarm moment? In which case, I'm happy to get it out of the way right now. <laughs> the other thing is lost. You don't want to be lost when it comes to skills. You want to be up there right with them. Um, and whatever skills you acquire, you want to make sure that you keep them up, that you don't lose them. It's the worst thing about, I was good at access once a long time ago. You couldn't put me near it now if you wanted to. So how do we learn a skill? Um, last night on Twitter, and I'm always looking at Twitter, um, I noticed a tweet about skills and literacies, that skills is something like using the various social media tools, but literacies would be knowing what's important to put into um, one social media or another where copyright is involved. 
when I was con conceiving this presentation, I actually didn't delineate it so properly. So when I say skill, you can think skill or you can think literacy, it's all encompassing for me. I'm going to talk about how I learned how to drive. If only because I'm figuring that most people know how to drive and those that don't have been in cars. This is my car, um, which is why I chose it. So from naught until about 17, I was Sherlock Holmes talking to Watson. You see, but you do not observe. I knew what the car was. I knew how it worked roughly. Um, so when I started learning how to drive at 17, I thought, oh yeah, I'm going to get this straight away. The one overriding voice from my mum, watch the tree, you're heading towards the tree, stop. We didn't hit the tree, but I didn't go driving again for about another four years. And then after that, it was more voices from my mum. My dad wouldn't get into the car with me, I don't know what that said. And it was, stay on your side of the road, stay out of the ditch, watch the other cars. You have to look at the road when you're changing gears. I said this to a number of other people and they all have similar words of encouragement from their parents. Um, stop looking in your rear view binner. you have to keep your eyes on the road being common. You take lessons, you go practice, you take lessons, you go practice, you pass your test, but can you honestly say that you've acquired good driving skills? I've never crashed, so I'm taking that as a plus. I do have penalty points, however, for speeding. So this is another important part of learning a skill. You have to know where the respective boundaries are. So I, when, every time I get into a car, I'm always watching my speed limits. Once you've acquired how one individual learns how, to drive, learns how to drive, learns a skill, it's easier then to think about how other people may. So for me, I like to think about it, do it, think about it some more, get some lessons, and go on in that manner. Not everybody is the same. Um, there's a big teaching and learning unit in Cork. Um, I'm doing a certificate in teaching and learning and higher education this year and teaching and the, they're flip sides of each other. I'm, this is something I'm really interested in. I have it, different qualifications for teaching and learning. The learning outcomes and competencies that Kennedy, Highland and Ryan talk about on this slide is just a better worded version of what I said in my last slide about learning how to drive. You have to be open to new experiences. You have to be willing to get out there and try and make mistakes. And this is because I don't like using um, so many words when I'm presenting. Most of what I have is pictures. Um, this is the most reading that you will have to do. Sometimes where we're going, it's uncharted territories. So you know in old maps, they talked about when you fell off the end of the map, you met dragons and monsters. I have my own personal dragon. Uh, somebody gave it to me when I started work to put the fear into other people, but really you want them to come into special collections. It's less about the fear. This is a map of early 19th century Cork. It's the 1801 map by William Beaufort. You know that it's that one because for anyone who's familiar with Cork, Patrick Street is co covered over in this. In previous ones, it was a river. So for people of the time, they were going off the map, trying out new things, not being able to row down Patrick Street anymore. Whenever we try something new, it is the essence of going off a map. So last year I presented at the HEA Net Conference on Digital Preservation. I thought, like I think a lot of things, oh, that'll be a great idea. And I put in for it, never realizing they may come back to me and say, yeah, we think it's a great idea too. Um, can you do it? And suddenly you have to find out a lot more about something than you already knew. That was digital preservation. I was interested in how we archive social media and make that available in the long term and what other institutions were doing, such as the National Library in New Zealand or the National Library here in Ireland, the British Library and the UK Web Archive um, selflessly wait, can I say that, because I couldn't say it earlier, um, selflessly, shamelessly promoting myself here, uh, go check out the HEA Nets website. When you approach what it is you want to learn, you in essence do a SWOT analysis on yourself. So you have your opportunities and your barriers and their expectations as well. I came across this slide shot of, um, slide shot, is that the right word, screenshot of Bosco, 
uh, children's um, character on TV when I was little. And his classic phrase, Tosheo Fosuk. So this is why some things just do not work for us. If we choose to be Gollum, we would focus only on one thing, not worry as much about the multiple different things that are out there. You can only do one thing well at a time. Um, we live in an age where we're constantly switching back and forth, all the various tabs, all the various <coughs> communication devices. Choose one, pick one. Sometimes we think that there isn't enough support and guidance to help us, but we are in a fabulous community already, a community of people who work in libraries at all levels, and everybody has different skills and advice to offer. One of my colleagues, if I want to know about carpets and how do I cut a carpet, I'll go to Martin O'Driscoll. Um, I'd never get that on the net as easily. I'd have to know who I have to go talk to. Sometimes it can be difficult for time to get the time off. Um, because I'm doing a certificate in teaching and learning, I was simultaneously doing the Ruddy 23, sorry, Ruddy 23 at the same time. It doesn't quite work, but you'll get it done in the end, especially if you get an extension. Not all courses are available face to face. Some of them you might find it easier to do with MOOCs. I'll sign up for as many MOOCs. I'll do the first two, three weeks. I'll get guilty, but I'll leave them, and I won't come back to them. And that isn't really getting me anywhere. I should do instead one MOOC and concentrate only on that and not on anything else. Sometimes we can also be a little put off by the place. I don't know if many of you come to any special collections or know about special collections. As Special Collections says, I am having my own Gollum moment. Um, <laughs> special Collections in UCC, for the undergrads I work with, they are all not scared, but wary. And I find that if I don't get them in as undergrads, I'm never going to get them in at all. So is there a way for me to make Special Collections slightly warmer and slightly fuzzier to entice them in the door? I think they're put off by our many, many rules. But once you explain the rules of why you can't have water and ink and such, they get it. But if you look at it head on, it can be really disconcerting. I seem to have used a lot of pop culture in doing this presentation. Ready Player One from video games, um, Pac-Man or Chucky Egg. Again, I'm a child of the 80s. Um, things that can go work for us and against us is DIY culture. So you, you may find it hard in your library to get people to you because they want to say, nope, I'm self-sufficient, I can do it by myself. Um, to explain to them that we may have tools that will get you to the skills that you need, even though you don't know, yet know that you need them, is tricky. Um, but the DIY culture can work for you as well because it's easier to promote for self-directed learning so long as you still have the motivation and resilience to get you through. I used the slide for Ready Player One um, on purpose because when you approach something, there's going to be levels of mastery and it's exactly the same with video games. That you have level one, level two, or if you're playing the inevitable Candy Crush, level 1400 I think they're up to at the moment. Can you imagine 1,400 different levels of mastery for one thing that is required? So things come in miniature little chunks. People think that we're doing a great job, which we are, let's give ourselves credit, we are doing a great job. But the success that we do, it's not a straight line, it's not linear, it's we're swans, we're gliding serenely along and then we're paddling so very furiously under the surface. It's the squiggly line. This I saw during the week a blog post about someone saying, I work too hard, my colleagues are telling me I have to take it easier, but I want to learn constantly different things and I have different work responsibilities. But you can't keep working incessantly, you have to take care of yourself as well. It's knowing where our various limits are. So you can try to learn new things, but you can't stretch yourself so thin that there's nothing of you left. 
that defeats the purpose entirely. Um, one of the quotes, and I'm probably going to mangle her name like I mangle everybody's name, Donna Lanclos, you can't be perfect. Things happen, you learn, and you do more stuff and better stuff and different stuff. So if for a while you feel like you're an imposter doing a job, don't worry, you're going to get there. Um, a couple of years ago, I attended Lear's annual seminar and Neave Walker Hedden um, talked, her presentation was called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. And I always really liked it um, because I think it's pretty much every time you try something new, you go in with trepidation, but after a while, it works itself out. So these are pictures of me paragliding in 2010 in Slovenia. We didn't go to Slovenia just with the intention of paragliding. It was, you know, an added benefit. Um, three of us went up, one of us stayed on the ground um, to take various photos. She said it was actually really hard to identify us because we were that high up. I was really glad she told me that when I was back on the ground. Um, but it's like driving, a good metaphor for learning anything. You get up to the top of the mountain, you see the edge, and you have that moment is this a smart move? Should I really be doing this? You're attached to somebody, so you, know, you don't have to worry about the technical aspects of controlling the paragliding apparatus. The one thing he told me was, don't stop running. If you stop running, we have to start over. Now, he didn't tell me what happens when we started to, stop, started to run and then stopped running. The edge was coming up really close, and it's hard to run because there's a lot of wind momentum. So, of, of course, I stopped running and I hit the ground and he fell on top of me and the canopy fell on top of the both of us. And I could hear him cursing in Slovenian and he says to me in English when he's calmer, okay, we have to start over and I'll go lay out the canopy. And the canopy is huge. It really is very, very large. So somebody else ran off ahead of me and then I started and he says to me, okay, whatever you do, don't stop running because you know what happens. So I said, okay, grand, run, 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 run. This is going to look fun on video. Run, 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 run towards the edge. And you think when you get to the edge that you have to stop running, you don't. You carry out like a cartoon character into the abyss. Keep running, keep running, keep running. We have to be well clear of the edge before you can stop running. I'll tell you to stop running. And we finally stopped running and we were well out going towards the lake. Um, I should probably mention I don't swim. Um, <laughs> I always thought that if I crashed over the lake, you know, it would be dire, but I'd done the worst of it. I had run out into open space. I had conquered my fear, and now I would totally go again. It's a Zen moment when you're that high up and you see everybody below. Um, it's amazing, and I would recommend it to absolutely everybody. We are within a community of learners. I have mentioned the community that I'm in in the room, a uh, community of librarians. But it's sometimes, as in special collections, I forget that my greatest community isn't, or my greatest collection isn't the stuff that I have on the shelves or my manuscripts or my older printed books. It is the people who come into me. And they are my most important collection and I don't normally consider them in that light. And we have to bring this collection along with us, um, or I have to wonder, am I working, giving them the skills that I think they need, or is it the skills that they actually need? And I'm reminded of something that one of my tutors told me in college, that we were going to be working with secondary school students who at the time would be going towards jobs that weren't yet invented. And I think that's, you know, something really difficult to grasp, that there's this continuous, you know, space-time continuum where you're going towards the complete unknown and you don't know where you're going to end up. What do I value most? Hopefully you're beginning to see, let me say it very plainly if not, that what I value is learning, acquiring new skills and constantly doing so and being aware that others will have to do the same and almost proselytizing that that is what is needed for all. It isn't called CPD for nothing. One of the courses that I'm engaged with is showing people how to use special collections material. So Jane Secker has talked about that we shouldn't be focused on 
showing people how to physically locate the material on the catalogue, we should instead be showing them how to use it afterwards. But for special collections, there's a middle step. Yes, you found that you want to use a book. Yes, you don't know quite yet where you're going to use it in your dissertation, but you may need to be shown how to actually physically open it or how to photograph it or how to do anything else with it because there are certain other things that are required. Um, and again, back to the shamelessly promotion. Um, I presented last year at Connell Teaching and Learning and this one slide was the basis for that presentation. So if you're interested more in how special collections works, this is something to look at. Having spoken on the same day as Alison Macrina, I can't honestly say that I'm giving my customers, my students, my users, myself, the tools to change the world. But I hope in one small way that I am. And please bear with me while I check my notes. I think the easiest way in some ways, it's like being my mom. How do you know if you have your skills? Can you teach somebody else what it is? Um, and for new staff members coming into special collections, that you pass on this torch of learning, one between the next. And hopefully that gives us a better understanding then of how students approach things. We must be future ready. I look to the HMC Horizon reports to see what's coming upstream. I have to have one eye on the future. Um, is it going to be a makerspace? Is it going to be Internet of Things? How is that going to work? What am I going to do? I'm returning to what Dermot Stokes said uh, last year's Health Sciences Library Group. The future depends on what you do today. I'm sure he meant it nicer than that, but I think that's a heck of a lot of responsibility. I'm looking at Darwin's tree of evolution here. You don't want to be on the branch that isn't going anywhere. The thing is, you may not realize that you're on that branch until it's too late. So it really is a mindset of thinking constantly, what's next? Where we're going, there are no roads. We all know back to the future. Um, I really like this quote from Virginia Woolf, not least because it mentions stereotyping, which is one of the words in this conference, but also because it talks about adventuring and curiosity. Um, it's not just about stepping off a mountain and going paragliding. It's that innate skill that small children have, where they're constantly reaching out for materials, constantly looking, which we seem to lose as we get older, and I'm not sure if it's because we don't want to look stupid or we wonder what other people are thinking or we just don't know what it is. So I would encourage myself simply by talking about it, but I would also want all of you to give things a go, to try something new and to try something new every day, to be your own Alice's and believe in six impossible things before breakfast, to keep adventuring. Thank you. Can you hear, oh yeah, you can hear me. Uh, thank you very much, Elaine. Uh, we have a few minutes if there are any questions. No All questions. Tutor. Fabulous. <laughs> Turn people into silence. That's fine. No, that's good. Sh Siobhan? Okay. Hi, um, just, I'll just give you the mic. Oh, right. I am Siobhan. Um, I just, uh, you mentioned it during the presentation that um, you, you take on the MOOCs and that yes. you have five of them, ten of them, and then you don't do any of them. Yes. How do you stop yourself? Like, do you have that perfect answer? Like, how can you slow down? Um, maybe I should only sign up to Future Learn, or is it Lily Plowling, or one of the other providers, and instead of looking at their whole catalogue and thinking, oh, I could do that, that, and that, just to say, okay, I'm interested in one particular area, one subsection, and say, I'm only going to look at the courses in that subsec subsection this time, and pick one. So if I only sign up for one MOOC in one six-month period or three-month period, then hopefully that might work. Mm -hmm. And then the next month, do I want to advance that area 
a next layer or am I going to switch to something else entirely? I'm hoping that will work, but I haven't actually tried it yet, so. Hey David. I'm not sure I need this microphone. <laughs> anyway, um, you made a very interesting and excellent point about um, your communities mm -hmm. being very, you know, your best collection yes. and a good source of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Would you not see your community and your network as a more authentic or valuable learning source of online courses? True. Um, I suppose because my community is dispersed, um, I hate to play the province card, but coming to Dublin only happens every so often. I'm, for all that I'm interested in technology and my own blog as things bright and shiny, I'm an absolute disaster when it comes to participating in Skyping or FaceTime or anything like that. But I should utilize it more definitely. Yep. Not just online, though, so person oh, person to person. Um, I know there's a document on oh, the dreaded Google Docs for academics about where they have, you know, if you're interested in getting a keynote speaker for this particular area, this is the person you talk to. But short of looking to everybody's staff pages within their libraries, I'm not sure if something similar exists. So if I wanted to know about, okay, carpets, um, do I talk to, who do I talk to within the libraries? Is that out there, or is that a project anyone would be interested in putting together? I suppose you could check the Twitter handles, librarian and carpeting. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, David. Thanks, So uh, we have a short break now. There's no coffee, just, <laughs> just in case there's any confusion. And um, <clears throat> just remind you to maybe have a look at the posters and to uh, maybe chat to the sponsors um, and uh, get your quiz uh, filled in. So we're then going into two parallel workshops. So we have three practical approaches to being seen and heard, and that is in the Swift Suite, and that's Laura Connaughton um, and Helen Fallon, Maynooth University, and Mary Delaney, IT Carlo. So that's upstairs. And in this room, there is planning a symposium to promote your collection, uh, Joanne Carroll and Marta Bastille. So that's here in this room. So uh, if you go off and have your break, and then if you head to the appropriate room, and I'll see some of you back here. Thank you.